Welcome to Reviving Virtue, a podcast where we face the urgent challenges of today's world by exploring the crucial role of uncovering, together, a coherent moral narrative for our time. I'm your host, Jeffrey Anthony, on a quest to tackle liberalism's quandary and pave the way towards a more unified society. Join me on this journey as we delve into ethics, philosophy, and community building, seeking to create a common understanding that fosters human flourishing and harmony. Welcome to Reviving Virtue. Hello there, Jeffrey Anthony here. I'm excited to guide you through another episode of Reviving Virtue. We're making our way into the fifth chapter of John Dewey's seminal work, The Public and Its Problems. This chapter is titled, Search for the Great Community. We're going to uncover some deep insights into the concept of democracy, exploring the nuances between its social and political aspects. To make things a little more relatable, we're going to use a jazz metaphor. And fair warning, it's going to feature prominently throughout this episode. So let's get, get on with this episode. So let's think of democracy as jazz music. And we will extend this metaphor to understand the first concept Dewey introduces in chapter five, that of the differences between political democracy and the social idea of democracy. Picture political democracy as the notes written on a piece of sheet music. They're the tangible, visible representations of the music. This is akin to the mechanisms and structures of government, the elected officials, voting systems, majority rule. They provide a framework, a melody, if you will, that structures our collective life. On the other hand, the social idea of democracy is like the spirit of jazz itself, the essence, the feel, the rhythm, the magic that happens during improvisation, that which is harder to pin down, but arguably the very essence of the music, that ineffable sense. This element encompasses the values, the desires, the unwritten rules that weave through our society and represent the rhythm that flow usually unnoticed within us, our families, schools, work culture, our spiritual and religious groups, the traditions that make up who we are. These two aspects are intertwined, the metaphor of the political democracy that notes on a page of music and the social idea of democracy, the spirit or essence of performing those notes on the page in the jazz idiom or tradition. They blend together to create a beautiful, harmonious piece of music, we hope. However, as Dewey points out, the governmental practices that we often see do not fully embody this democratic ideal. Just as a lead sheet written for a jazz performance cannot fully capture the vibrancy and spontaneity of a live performance, our democratic institutions are not the fullest realization of the democratic idea. They demand that people within these institutions react to the needs, desires, and problems of the time creatively and courageously. They demand the people within these institutions react to the needs, desires, and problems of their time creatively and courageously. Moreover, the citizens of the democratic society must also be an active part of this process. They shouldn't expect governmental practices, to use a Deweyan term, to just operate on autopilot based on some idealized notion of democracy, which may be ill-suited for the present moment. Remember, Dewey insists, there are no absolutes and it is incumbent upon us to meet the challenges of our time. I see this as Dewey really just hammering home the point of responsibility. This is our responsibility. In our jazz metaphor, it's like expecting a jazz band to play perfectly just by following a lead sheet without considering the audience, the venue, the mood of the moment, the other people within the band. The real magic happens when the musicians respond to their environment, when they riff off each other's energy, when they listen to the audience's reaction and adjust their per performance accordingly. This is just as a thriving democracy requires active, engaged participation from both its leaders and citizens, constantly attuning to the ever-changing rhythms of societal needs and responding creatively. When this intelligent, again, we're using John Dewey's understanding of the word intelligent, engagement with the world is not in tune with the needs of time and place, this is where our tune starts to sound a bit off key. While the sheet music is essential for providing the basic structure with the key, tempo, and form, we can't lose sight of the spirit, the improvisation, the groove, the vibe, the interplay that makes jazz, well, jazz. In the same vein, our democratic institutions play a vital role. 
we must not forget the underlying social ideas and moral aspirations that make democracy what it is. Now, you might be wondering, what's the cure for this? More notes? More refined sheet music? Dewey suggests that we need to return to the idea itself, to the jazz, so to speak. He pushes us to clarify, deepen our understanding of democracy's meaning, and use this understanding to critique and reform its political manifestations. He demands that we constantly reevaluate what it means to be living in a democratic society. We cannot be on autopilot. Dewey moves into this idea of the displacement of the need for more public input. I mean, think about a time you've been part of a sports team, let's say a soccer team. As members of the team, you're, you all have a common goal to score and prevent the other team from doing so. But achieving this goal isn't as simple as just showing up on the field. It demands coordination, communication, and most importantly, active participation from every member. Now, imagine if only a few players were deciding the game plan and others were just expected to follow without having a say. The team's performance would likely be subpar and the players would feel excluded and demotivated. There's just no groove there. There's no vibe. There's no, yeah, what's the word I'm looking for? There's, there's no culture there. The team's performance would likely be subpar and the players would feel excluded and demotivated. In the same vein, in the grand game of democracy, all citizens are players. And for the team to perform well, every player must have a say in the strategies and tactics, the policies and decisions that guide our collective life. Dewey argues that the democratic ideal calls for more public input, more participation from the citizens. As he puts it, the government exists to serve its community, and this purpose can't be achieved unless the community itself has a hand in selecting its governors and determining their policies. However, Dewey acknowledges the challenges in enabling the public to express its purposes authoritatively. He talks about the intellectual problem of transforming the great society, a society with diverse, scattered, and mobile groups, into a great community. This leads us to the next theme. Okay. Picture this transformation of the great society into a great community, like turning a wild, overgrown garden into a carefully planned, harmonious landscape. In the great society, we're like the individual plants growing and thriving, really just digging our environment, but not necessarily contributing to the cohesive whole. It's akin to a wild, overgrown garden where every plant does its own thing without regard to others. In the great community, however, we're like plants in a well-tended garden growing in coordination with each other, creating a balanced, beautiful whole. The great community, according to Dewey, is a society where everyone participates according to their capacity in forming and directing the activities of the groups they belong to. Everyone has a responsibility to share. Just like every plant in a well-tended garden has its own space, contributes to the overall aesthetics, and is carefully nurtured according to its needs. The democratic ideal, in its social sense, is exactly this. It's about liberating the potentialities of individuals in harmony with the common interests and goods. Dewey asserts that democracy is not an alternative to other principles of associated life. It's not like choosing between rock or jazz or classical music. Instead, it's the idea of community life itself. It's like the underlying harmony that allows different melodies to come together and create a symphony. Now, as we move ahead in, the, in chapter five, Think about a young artist staring at a blank canvas. Their creation is not yet physically present. It's an ideal, a vision in their mind that they strive to bring into reality stroke by stroke. Democracy, Dewey suggests, can be viewed in this light. It's a, an ideal we aspire to, constantly evolving and never fully attained. Just as an artist's vision guides each brushstroke, the democratic ideal guides our societal actions and experiments. It's not about reaching an unchanging perfect end state, no. Rather, it's about the movement and progression towards that ideal, the continuous process of learning, adapting, and improving. This concept is encapsulated in one of Dewey's insightful quotes, and I quote Dewey here, Regarded as an idea, democracy is not an alternative to other principles of associated life. It is the idea of community life itself. It is an ideal in the one intelligible sense of an ideal, namely, the tendency and movement of some thing which exists carried to its final limit, viewed as a complete, perfected 
Since things do not attain such fulfillment, but are in actuality distracted and interfered with, democracy in this sense is not a fact and never will be. This is a pretty amazing quote there, <laughs> right? We can never get to that perfect point. It's, an, it's a continual project. There is never such a thing as business as usual, and there never should be. The democratic ideal, as Dewey sees it, is born out of the belief in the potentialities of human being and the faith in the possibility of common goods realized through conjoint activity. It's akin to a symphony of different instruments playing together in harmony, each contributing their unique sound to create a unified piece of music that is appreciated and enjoyed by all. But this symphony is not static. It's ever-changing, always emerging anew. Much like Deleuze and Guattari's conception of reality, the score may guide the music, but the performance is always unique, shaped by the musician's interpretation and interaction with one another and the audience. Democracy, then, isn't a static endpoint, but a dynamic process, reminiscent of the Deleuzean idea of becoming. It's like the ebb and flow of a river, with the riverbanks constantly moving and reshaping themselves, carving out new paths and adapting to changing landscapes. The pursuit of democracy in this light, it's a pursuit of an ever-evolving ideal, constantly emerging reality that demands active participation and continuous dialogue and constant evolution. It's not simply about achieving a state of democratic perfection. No, it's about engaging in the process of democratic becoming. So in an essence, while the notes of political democracy may be written on the sheet music of governmental structures, the melody that brings these notes to life, the social idea of democracy, is a dynamic improvisational jazz performance. It's born from our collective ideals and becomes a beautiful, harmonious piece of music only when all of us are actively participating, contributing our unique rhythms and adapt to the ever-changing beats of our societal needs and changes and challenges. So taking this metaphor of the democratic symphony a little bit further, let's explore the distinctive elements of this orchestration, the themes of fraternity liberty, and equality, as envisioned by Dewey in the context of this communal life he's, he's articulating. These values are inseparable components of our of a democratic society. They resonate strongly with the currents of the river of democracy, finding their importance and relevance even in the continually evolving world of today. So the ideas of fraternity, liberty, and equality, in this context, Dewey argues that these terms, when detached from the idea of community, become hopeless abstractions. Their meanings are only validated and guided when they serve a characteristic of a community in the sense of a democratically functioning society, the public. So let's explore these one by one. So fraternity in a communal context can be seen as the shared good resulting from an association in which everyone participates equally. In contemporary society, we see this in the collective efforts to tackle common challenges such as climate change where everyone's contribution from small personal changes to corporate and governmental measures is needed to create a sustainable future. We see fraternity in the shared celebration of, di of diversity and the unified response to threats of social harmony. Now, obviously, we're having some problems here with climate change, but we're losing that fraternity aspect. And this is why I think we need to create some moral narratives that can provide that glue and also that background upon which we can articulate a fraternity in order to tackle a wicked problem such as climate change in which we need everyone, everyone and every type of entity, all working towards the same goal harmoniously. Now, liberty, as Dewey suggests, is the realization of personal potentialities within the rich and diverse association with others. In our modern world, liberty is cherished as the freedom to express oneself, to pursue one's dreams, and to live according to one's values all while participating in a larger community. Now, libertarians are often confused by this last part, all while participating in a larger community. It is through the larger community that our personal potentialities are manifest, not in spite of this community. This vision of liberty is far from being a detachment from societal ties. No, it rather involves an active engagement and contribution to society. So if we move on to equality, Equality is the equal share each community member has in the consequences of the associated action, measured by need and capacity to utilize. Equality today is seen in the fight against systemic prejudices and in the effort to provide equitable opportunities for all, regardless of race, gender, socioeconomic status, or any other distinguishing factor. Dewey also brings in the critical distinction between mere associated activity 
in the development of a real community. According to him, any collective action doesn't necessarily constitute a community. The community comes into being when the shared consequences of these collective actions are consciously recognized and pursued. Similar to Deleuze and Guattari's philosophy of becoming an ever-emerging reality. In this light, Dewey's argument becomes particularly relevant in today's interconnected world, where communication is paramount and the actions of individuals and societies have increasingly global implications. The we and the are that he speaks of manifest today in the collective efforts to address global issues, be it the global health crisis, climate change, or social and economic disparities. Okay. We're going to move on to some symbols, the idea of symbols. So Dewey emphasizes the power of symbols and communication and converting physical and organic interaction into a shared coherent community of action. This idea aligns particularly well with today's digital age where communication fueled by symbols has become an influential tool in shaping societal narratives and catalyzing change. Social media platforms, for example, enable more voices to be heard and more people to participate in the democratic process, reflecting Dewey's idea of a community bound by mutual interests and shared meanings. However, Dewey also underscores that this process of conversion is not instantaneous or complete. It's an ongoing task that poses constant challenges. He states, and I quote, we are born organic beings associated with others, but we are not born members of a community. Hence, it is through education and experience that we learn to be human, to recognize our distinct individuality within a community, and to contribute to the continual development of human resources and values. The essence of Dewey's thought here is captured in the Deleuzian concept of becoming, which we mentioned earlier in a podcast. So democracy is this dynamic, never-ending, continuous process. So it's through our contributions to this effort that we partake in this democratic symphony that I've been, been talking about. So this transformation, however, is contingent on the adequate distribution of knowledge, and this is critical, about the knowledge that we have is not, currently today, is not equitably distributed. In fact, it's the intentional, it's the intentional scarcity of knowledge, making knowledge scarce to the broader community that's leveraged by firms and, and other individuals to gain advantages over other people. A society informed by a vivid sense of shared interest can lead to different outcomes from a society operating only on a physical level or one where knowledge is transmitted unevenly, which is what we have today, and it's intentional. As a result, we shouldn't view the interpretation of economic processes as deterministic. Overlooking the transformative impact of shared understanding and communication, it should not be seen merely as an invisible hand of the market an idea Dewey finds incoherent. In episode three, we discussed the concept of the invisible hand. And so it's a metaphor that imagines that the economy as an autonomous entity guided by natural forces. I always put natural in quotes. I really, really do not like that phrase when we talk about economics. It's an intentional that they use that language. It's not an accident, right? So that the economy as an autonomous entity is guided by these natural forces beyond human control. Dewey's critique of this notion aligns with his broader views on the participatory nature of democracy and the role of shared meanings and communication in shaping societal structures, including the economy. The economy is a social system, right? We constitute it. It's not a universal. So contrary to the invisible hand metaphor, the neoliberal economics theory that gripped our country from the early mid-70s onward, led by economists like Milton Friedman and Heidegg and Ludwig von Mises, man, those people are terrible. Illustrates Dewey's points. These economists posited that unfettered markets would naturally regulate themselves for the best possible outcome. <laughs> However, in practice, this theory often resulted in an obscuring of the social and political impacts of economic actions. You don't say. It's almost like it's intentional. The neoliberal approach often leads to a sense of powerlessness over economic functions, forcing conformity to mathematical, scientific, economic precepts, and discouraging creative, courageous responses to economic challenges. The theory asserts a divide between the economic and the social, or political, detaching economic actions from the broader societal consequences, which is incoherent, but is an intentional project by the neoliberal whole framework because they don't want people to realize they actually can change this. You can. That's what I'm trying to get across here. This economy that we live in today, this economic structure is a complete social construction 
and has no bearing on any sort of objective reality. So Dewey's perspective reveals this divide as a harmful illusion. It's a complete illusion. He posits that an informed public, aware of the consequences of economic actions and motivated by shared interests, can indeed influence economic outcomes. He emphasizes that the economy is not some separate impersonal entity, but a part of our shared social experience shaped by our collective actions and decisions. This understanding reasserts the importance of democratic participation and public communication in the economic sphere and encourages us to reclaim our agency in shaping our economic destiny. This is where knowledge comes in. This is why knowledge is purposefully circumscribed, made scarce, because the people with this knowledge can exploit other people and other institutions and other cultures and other nations. This is not a bug. It's a feature. So rather than leading to our disempowerment, economic theory and practice should pave the way to our empowerment. We are not mere spectators in our economic existence, but active creative contributors molding the economy in a manner that mirrors our shared ideals and ambitions. Neoliberalism, however, with its firm foundations and subverting individual agency removes our ability to engage intelligently, again, in the Dulian sense of intelligence, and creatively with our current needs. This model, predicated on austere ideals and an absolutist perspective championed by figures such as Friedman, Hayek, and von Mises, denies the fluidity of our societal needs and aspirations intentionally. There is nothing natural or unchangeable about the economy. It is a social construct, much like the public itself. As such, we mustn't allow it to govern us as if it were an immutable universal law. It's as absurd as accepting a man, man-made dam as an inherent part of the river's flow. We built the dam, and we have the power to modify it if it no longer serves the greater good. The concept of democratic becoming applies equally to the economic sphere as it does to the political. Our collective actions and decisions have the power to shape the economy just as significantly as they mold our political landscape. The proactive participatory approach is the cornerstone of an economy that genuinely reflects and meets the needs and values of the people, the public. So continuing our jazz metaphor from the top of this episode, a jazz performance in its finest form is an exercise in creative freedom, in the moment improvisation, in the fluid back and forth with the audience, intelligently. Now imagine if this performance were subject to neoliberal ideals regulatory body would interrupt, dictating which notes are correct, how the audience should react at specific times, and stifling the musician's creative expression. The music, once a vibrant, dynamic entity, would become rigid, lifeless, its soul replaced with an unchanging set of rules and regulations. This is what happens when we allow neoliberal economic theories to constrain our societal and economic life. Instead, like a jazz musician, we must dare to improvise, to interact, to creatively engage with the moment, creating a coherent economy that resonates with our shared values, aspirations, and lived experiences of our time. The public should not be viewed as a static museum exhibit, nor should humanity be considered lifeless or inanimate. We are living embodiments of the potentialities within our ever-changing, continually learning universe. It's essential that we embrace this fundamental aspect of our existence and celebrate our capacity for change, growth, and transformation. We've been exploring the, the metaphor of jazz and its application to the economic and social structures of our society, highlighting the importance of improvisation and active engagement. This creative energy is not just the hallmark of a jazz performance, but as per Dewey's philosophy, the very heartbeat of our individual and societal existence, encapsulated in what he calls habit. Now let's shift our attention to a parallel yet nuanced concept that emerges in the work of sociologist Pierre Bordeaux, the concept of habitus. This idea adds another layer to our understanding of how our behaviors and societal interactions are shaped. John Dewey believed that habits are not merely repetitive actions, but active and learning orientated behaviors that form the backbone of human society. Our habits both preserve societal order and shape our individual identities. They allow us to function within familiar frameworks, thereby creating a sense of security and predictability. However, there's a dynamic nature to habits 
They are not set in stone. Each action we take, Dewey argues, modifies our attitudes, influencing our future behavior. In this view, habits are not chains binding us, but the fertile soil from which we sprout and grow, where we can exercise our agency and creativity. Now, I'm going to bring in another thinker. Bordeaux was particularly interested in power dynamics within societies and how culture and symbolic forms of capital contribute to social inequities or social inequalities. Now, one of Bordeaux's key contributions is the concept of habitus, H-A-B-I-T-U-S. This concept was a tool he developed to understand the unconscious aspect of social life. It's a deeply embedded generative dynamic that guides our actions, tastes, and dispositions. Now, Bordeaux's notion of habitus echoes Dewey's concept of habit in intriguing ways. Habitus for Bordeaux refers to the deeply ingrained habits, skills, and dispositions that we develop in response to external social structures and conditions. It's like the tune we find ourselves humming without realizing a rhythm so embedded within us, reflecting our social norms and values. But a habitus, like Dewey's habit, is not deterministic. It too possesses transformative potential. Through the habitus, Bordeaux explains how individuals navigate social spaces, engage with societal structures, and intentionally reshape them. However, the power dynamics and societal pressures shaping the habitus often constrain this potential for transformation, fostering conformity and reproducing social inequalities. Sounds familiar. Combining Dewey's concept of habit and Bordeaux's idea of habitus gives us a profound understanding of the interplay between individuals and society and how this interplay shapes economic and social systems. Our habits and habitus mold our responses to the socioeconomic structures around us, but they also hold the key to challenging and transforming these very structures. This is why I'm talking about it. In essence, Dewey's habit and Bordeaux's habitus underscores our innate capacity for agency and change, that courageous creativity I speak of in every episode that we must tap into, especially when confronting the rigid and constraining structures of neoliberal economic systems. Now, focusing more closely on the Deweyan side of this, Dewey's concept of habit is the cornerstone of his philosophy. In his work, he asserts that habit is the mainspring of human action, a statement which underscores the pivotal role habit plays in how we navigate our world. According to Dewey, habits are primarily formed under the influence of groups of customs. They are forged not by isolated individuals, but within the interconnected social networks in which we're embedded. This is really profound when you think about this. We think of habits as something we do on our own, and we, we have to fix our habits. So he declares, the dependence of habit forming upon those habits of a group which constitute customs and institutions is a natural consequence of the helplessness of infancy. In other words, we are born into a web of existing social norms and practices that shape our behaviors from a young age. Just think about this. When we start to gain consciousness, we're just we're, we're thrown into this existing web, as Dewey says. You know, we, so much of this is just us trying to figure out what the heck's going on, just trying to make sense of this existing web. I feel like most of, the, of our lives is trying to uncover all this that we're already thrown into. That's what this podcast is about, too, trying to rearticulate or find an articulation to make sense of our world. Because as many philosophers are saying, it's completely incoherent. So as, as we started this section off, Dewey goes in to discuss the profound social consequences of habit. Habits, according to Dewey, bind us to orderly and established ways of action. They channel our thinking, guiding it along certain lines. He writes, habits do not preclude the use of thought, but it determines the channels within which it operates. In essence, our habits frame our perspectives and determine the boundaries of our thinking. At the same time, Dewey acknowledges the transformative potential of habits. He states that changes take place and are cumulative in character, while habits can be conservative forces maintaining social order and stability. They also have the potential to evolve and to drive change. This understanding of habit is central to Dewey's philosophy of democratic becoming, underscoring the dynamic and evolving nature of society. So in synthesizing Dewey's ideas with Bordeaux now, we see a fascinating interplay. Habits, whether framed as Dewey's learning-oriented behaviors or Bordeaux's habitus, serve as both the instruments and outcomes of social structures and norms. They form the basic rhythm of our lives, right? Guiding our actions, thoughts, and interactions. But these habits are not deterministic. They both shape and are shaped by our lived experiences of 
back and forth, right? Thus, this leaves room for agency, creativity, and the courageous transformation. We're going to go in, a, in some future ap- episodes looking at tradition, rationality based on traditions and the Aristotelian lens. And we'll look at Alastair McIntyre's work and his whole idea of building. He's looking at habits in a way, but he's calling them traditions. This is a big theme in coming up with moral narratives. So Bordeaux's idea of habitus opens up new ways to understand and harness this transformative potential as well, right? Understanding and leveraging the habitus can empower us to challenge and reshape the socioeconomic norms that are constraining us. Now, as we consider these concepts in relation to our neoliberal economic systems, we see that habitus and habitus are not merely passive responses to these structures. They are actively engaged with interpreting and reshaping these systems. Our habits and habitus can thus be a source of creativity, innovation, and change, elements that are vital in creating an economy that aligns with our shared values, aspirations, and lived experiences. All right, moving on. In this next section, Dewey raises a pressing concern about the complicated interplay between technology, society, and our collective understanding. Technology. It's a big one. Technology has advanced the scale and complexity of our socioeconomic systems, and yet our comprehension of these systems has not kept pace. You don't say. People, even the most successful ones, seem to operate within systems they they do not fully understand. Dewey posits that skill and ability work within a framework that we neither created nor comprehend. Those who are successful can exploit some phase of the system for personal gain, but even they cannot control and manipulate the whole system. Dewey draws an interesting comparison between the limited knowledge of a successful person and a competent machine operator. This is interesting. Both can manipulate their immediate environments and manage the flow of events in their vicinity, yet they lack control over the wider system. According to Dewey, the general public is no wiser or more effective. The primary prerequisite for a democratically organized public, in his view, is a kind of knowledge and insight that currently doesn't exist. The cornerstone of a functioning democracy, he argues, is a well-informed citizen. Citizenry. The cornerstone of a functioning democracy, he argues, is a well-informed citizenry. Right? Knowledge. This is where Dewey's concept of intelligence comes into play again. Actually, like, how do you apply intelligence, as Dewey says, you have to have the information, you have to gain the knowledge. For him, intelligence is not just about cognitive abilities or knowledge possession. This is why I keep saying intelligence in a Deweyan sense. He sees it as a transformative problem-solving force, a tool for adapting to and improving our shared environments and experiences. It's a form of practical wisdom that goes beyond simple factual knowledge. So in this context, the well-informed citizenry, citizenry, in this context, the well-informed citizenry means an engaged public capable of intelligently navigating and addressing the complexities of social life. It's not about resigning oneself to an inappropriate conception of the state and public as inert objects, predetermined to move through history without human influence. No, instead, intelligent recognizes our capacity and the fact that we're already influencing the conditions that shape history and the future. We must use this intelligence to reflect on our current situations intelligently, adapting creatively and courageously. The essence of Dewey's argument is that we are not merely passengers on the ship of a state, but rather it's active navigators capable of steering it towards better horizons. So Dewey firmly asserts that the freedom of to pursue social inquiry and distribute its finding is vital, the transmission of knowledge. This translates to the freedom of expression and thought being indispensable for a well-functioning democracy and a, an informed public. The capacity to articulate and spread ideas is fundamental to the development of the methodologies for social inquiry and the advancement and refinement of the practical tools we need. Now, however, Dewey's critique doesn't stop with freedom of expression. He contends that believing thought and communication to be free merely because legal constraints have been lifted is a fallacy. I'm going to, re- I'm going to say that again, note to self. Dewey contends that believing thought and communication to be free merely because legal restraints have been lifted is a fallacy, right? Genuine intellectual freedom is not simply a condition, but an action. This is a key I'm going to repeat. Genuine intellectual freedom is not a condition. It 
It is an action requiring methods and means to control circumstances. This involves not only the elimination of certain external constraints, but also the proactive pursuit of knowledge. We must work continually, and we must work to provide the opportunities for others to work continually on this project. Despite this, Dewey observes that our comprehension of intellectual freedom is flawed. He argues that complacency in instances where intellectual freedom is absent leads to superficiality, sensationalism, and a dearth of substantive, 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 and a dearth of substantive ideas. This very complacency encourages characteristics of our current state with respect to social knowledge. So to elaborate on Dewey's point, let's consider a musical metaphor again that mirrors our current debate on cancel culture, an issue prominently seen in online discourse. I was trained as a jazz musician and spent over 20 years as a professional touring and session musician. I've mentioned this before. Being this type of musician means being open to where the music takes you, not in a passive observation, but actively participating in the creation of a musical expression. So let's dive into a hypothetical experience from my past and consider what might happen if we were to extrapolate the current left cancel culture phenomenon onto that. So we're going to flash back to 15 years ago on this hypothetical. I'm performing at a jazz venue with a quartet. We discussed the concept of the AABA form in jazz in episode two, if you want to review that. And we're playing a standard tune in this form. So having just completed the head, we're at the top of the solo section. Then the tenor player starts improvising over the changes. Suddenly, the tenor player decides to play a half step away from the chord changes during the B section. Perhaps he wants the rest of us to hear the dissonance and amp up our playing. Or maybe he's hinting to me, the drummer, and the bass player to start some metric modulating and playing a dissonant meter across the rhythm of the piano player. Who knows? But as a trained musician attuned to the fact that the tenor player is playing a half step away from the understood changes for the B section of this song, we understand that he's communicating something to us. It's our job to intelligently, again in the Dewey sense, to respond and actively contribute to this mode of articulating the current lived moment. We won't know what will work until we do it in real time in front of an audience. This is how the magic and the awe happens. Now envision an alternate scenario. Instead of collaborating with the tenor's unconventional move, other members within the quartet impose their silence upon him by simply stopping. They effectively cancel his performance and his voice. It's as if an invisible hand reaches out and mutes the performance. This internal policing mirrors the phenomenon of cancel culture, where the dynamic and open-ended space for exploration is suddenly truncated, erasing the space for spontaneous creation and any potential for opening new modes of understanding. In societal conversations, much like in jazz, Dewey advises vigilance against such overt and covert obstructions to free communication, suppressing individual expressions, exploiting social relationships, and succumbing to mass prejudices can hinder the organic development of social knowledge. To have a truly harmonious social ensemble, we must be willing to engage in conversation that may at times be discordant. We need to recognize the value, the individual notes and phrases that contribute to the overall performance of our democratic symphony. This is the essence of Dewey's call for intellectual freedom, a well-informed public engaging in open, respectful, and thoughtful discourse to navigate the complexities of our shared social life. This orientation, in order to succeed, must embrace the virtues of open-mindedness, courage, prudence, justice, compassion, and an unyielding fidelity to hope rooted in the fertile soil of our limitless potential for productive associative collaborations. Now, reflecting upon Dewey's thoughts, we find ourselves drawn towards a facet of society that we often fail to appreciate for its true worth. It's often said that even if we manage to perfect inquiry, it wouldn't necessarily make a significant impact on society because the majority of the public isn't particularly interested in learning and digesting the outcomes of such investigations. We covered this in our first episode of this series as Dewey spent several pages illustrating this dynamic. It's in essence the fruits of rigorous exploration and inquiry might just languish within the secluded eight cloves of a library, savored by only a handful of intellectuals. But that's where we underestimate the potency of art in this process. Here's the truth. Presentation matters, and presentation is fundamentally an art. It's a practice. Dewey's argument brings the point to the fore to quote. 
Presentation is fundamentally important, and presentation is a question of art. End quote. If you produce a newspaper that was just a daily edition of scholarly journals, the chances are that it would find appeal only among a niche audience. But imagine if the material in that journal, rich in its human relevance, was presented in a way that resonated with the masses. That's where the artist comes in. Unleashing the power of creative expression is as crucial to shaping informed public opinion as is freeing the process of social inquiry. Even as Richard Rorty said in Irony, Contingency, and Solidarity, to quote, the novel, the movie, and the TV program have, gradually but steadily, replaced the sermon and the treaties as the principal vehicles of moral change and progress. He wrote that in the 1980s. To quote Dewey again, the function of art has always been to break through the crust of conventionalized and routine consciousness, the habits, right? Common things, a flower, a gleam of moonlight, the song of a bird, not things rare and remote, are means with which the deeper levels of life are touched so that they spring up as desire and thought. This process is art. Artistic expression is a potent disseminator of ideas capable of invoking profound human emotion and thought. As Dewey suggests, to transform our great society into a great community, this is how we started our episode, right? We need a fusion of rigorous social inquiry with a subtle, delicate, vivid, and responsive art of communication. This coalescence is critical in navigating the tools of our age, not as domineering masters, but as instruments that enrich life. Poets like Walt Whitman and many more have echoed this vision, which Rorty summarizes eloquently in this quote. To quote, it is pictures rather than propositions, metaphors rather than statements, which determine most of our philosophical convictions. End quote. The culmination of this democratic dream is the seamless union of free social inquiry with artful, impactful communication steering us toward a future of deeper understanding and unity. Our endeavor, then, isn't merely academic, but also creative, engaging with the rich tapestry of human experience reflected in art and literature. This field of inquiry is vast, yet immensely rewarding, enriched by the insights of Harold Bloom, who championed literature's transformative potential to broaden our understanding of self, others, and our shared world. Such a perspective is also reflected in the work of literary critic Northrop Fry, who saw literature as a reservoir of cultural archetypes and social imagination, and the philosopher Martha Nussbaum, who has argued for the critical role of literature in cultivating empathy and understanding in society. These thinkers, among others, illuminate the intricate interplay between art, literature, and democracy. Thus, our commitment to democracy is also a commitment to the expressive avenues that enlighten us challenge us and bring us together. The journey we embark upon isn't just about traversing the landscape of democracy. It's about actively steering this ship, navigating towards a future that we desire and deserve. So we have gotten to the end of episode five of Reviving Virtue. Thank you for joining me today. I look forward to continuing this conversation with you next week. And it's episode number six, our last one of the Dewey series. Well, it's the last one of the public and its problems. We're going to do more Dewey. So until then, let's each do our part to nurture our societal garden, fostering growth of shared symbols, meaning virtues and moral narratives that resonate with our time and aspirations. All transcripts, if you want, are available on Patreon for our $3 a month Moral Explorer tier. And if you upgrade to $5 a month Ethical Pioneer tier, you can listen to the podcast early and receive a private RSS feed, which you can subscribe to through our podcast app. There's no need to listen through Patreon for that. I usually finish each episode Thursday or Friday. And this gives you four to five days early access. Thank you, and we'll see you next week. Be well.